Born on January 13th of 1963, Peter Gerard Scully was born and raised in the Australian city of Melbourne. Little is known about his childhood, though it's believed that he was raised Catholic by two strict Scotch-Irish parents. After graduating university, Peter made a living as some kind of property developer and became exceptionally wealthy in the process. By the mid-2000s, Peter was living with his wife and two children in a large four-bedroom house in suburban Melbourne. He had a life that almost anyone would be envious of, but one day, his entire world began to fall apart. In 2011, Peter and his partners were forced to declare bankruptcy after a development scheme of theirs appeared to completely fall through. Very little work had been done on the actual construction site, yet Peter and his company claimed that every penny of the $2.6 million investment fund was gone. Naturally, their investors weren't happy and initiated legal proceedings against Peter and his partners. Peter claimed that he could account for losses in the way that was perfectly legal, but in reality, he was already preparing to flee the country. For years, he'd been scamming investors out of their money in what amounted to a very well-disguised Ponzi scheme. By the time it emerged that Peter was indeed acting illegally, he had already fled Australia on a false passport before establishing an entirely new identity in the Philippines' capital of Manila. Once he'd established a degree of anonymity, and knowing that Manila was the first place Filipino police would look for him, Peter traveled over land and sea before reaching the southernmost island on Mindanao. It was here that Peter began setting up a new life for himself, and although he'd managed to flee Australia with a sizable amount of investors' cash, his expensive tastes meant that it would only be a matter of months before he was flat broke again. Peter needed a way of earning a living, yet he couldn't do so legally as it would almost certainly give away his location to the authorities. He obviously wasn't afraid of operating outside of legal constraints, but with his reputation in tatters, there was no way of him securing any reliable outside investment. Peter needed money, he needed a lot of it, and he needed it quickly. So he turned to the darkest and most depraved of all online marketplaces, the exploitation of children. With the help of two Filipino women named Karma An Alvarez and Lizo Margario Castaña, Peter began setting up one of the most evil and prolific child exploitation websites in contemporary history. He would send Alvarez and Castaña out into some of Mindanao's poorest towns and villages, promising generous financial compensation to the parents of any child willing to hand them over for the purposes of a photo shoot. The children were then returned a few days later, visibly shaken but with sizable wads of cash with them. The children either never spoke of the ordeals they'd faced at the hands of Peter and his so-called girlfriends, and those that did were either hushed up or disregarded. The harrowing abuse that took place at Peter's photo shoots were recorded before the videos were uploaded onto a dark web messaging forum that he created named No Limits Fun. The most notorious of these videos was entitled Daisy's Destruction and depicts the despicable abuse of three underage Filipino girls. A mere preview was uploaded to the webpage while Peter offered visitors the full unedited recording for around 10,000 US dollars. One of the most active of the abusers in the tape is the 19-year-old Liesl Margallo, who had herself been trafficked at a similar age as the children that she ended up abusing. For five long years, Peter and his accomplices continued to traffic and abuse children until one day, Karma Alvarez appeared to have had a change of heart. To Karma's knowledge, Peter's routine was simple. He'd trick a parent into giving him their child, record their exploitation, and return them with money. But even this had proved too burdensome on her conscience. She apparently pressured him to raise his age bracket, so to speak, and to introduce alcohol to the girls so they didn't suffer as much during the abuse. Peter seemed to have agreed to this, as in 2015, he coaxed two teenage girls back to his home with the promise of food and alcohol. The girls came willingly at first, but when it became evident that Peter planned to abuse them and to document it no less, they attempted to escape. Peter and his photographer, the identity of whom remains unclear, apprehended the girls in the process of their escape, 
before brutally beating them and dragging them into the home's earthen cellar. There, each girl was forced to dig their own grave before Peter announced that they were to be buried alive. The girls begged and pleaded for their lives, swearing on all they held dear that they'd never breathe a word of what had occurred that evening. It was only then that Peter planned to let them go, confident that fear would forever seal their lips. But before that, he decided to hang on to them for a few more days, just to make sure that he'd made his point clear. It was during this period of captivity that the girls were discovered chained up in the basement by Karma Alvarez. Horrified at what Peter had done, she waited until Peter left the house and then freed the girls from their bindings and allowed them to escape. She then drove to the nearest police station and told the whole grim tale to a pair of dumbstruck police officers. To locate and infiltrate Peter's dark web exploitation ring, the Filipino police enlisted the help of the Dutch National Child Exploitation Team. The international barriers in this investigation disappeared very quickly, noted Dutch detective Farid El Hamoudi. Everyone wanted the same thing, getting the responsible people behind bars. The NCET's White Hat hackers made short work of the website's digital defenses. It was a welcome breakthrough, but what they found was nothing short of traumatizing. Peter's website accounted for one of the largest collections of exploitative images police have ever found, with hundreds of thousands of images accounting for thousands upon thousands of potential victims. Peter's own contributions were merely the tip of the iceberg, but what police found most disturbing was the sheer demand for new content. The exact number of sales Peter made has never been made public, but the millions of dollars in cryptocurrency seized from his digital wallet gives us an idea of the sheer volume. When it came time to put Peter in handcuffs, an international dragnet ensured that he had no escape from the Philippines or its surrounding territories. Police eventually tracked Peter to Malay Belay City, where he was arrested on February 20th of 2015. His arrest and eventual conviction led to the apprehension of another Australian predator, 22-year-old Matthew Graham. Using the pseudonym Lux, Graham ran a number of what he referred to as Hurtcore sites on the dark web. These websites specialized in the proliferation of particularly violent child exploitation videos, and at his trial, Graham disgusted those in attendance by claiming that he had acted in the name of freedom. At his own trial, Peter Scully faced a grand total of 75 criminal charges, with most of them pertaining to the trafficking and exploitation of children. He was tried along with two other men, a Brazilian named Hanno Caetano de Oliveira and a German man named Christian Rusch, who were said to have played an intimate role in the recording and dissemination of Peter's crimes. Sections of the video were shown to the jury, who later described how the girl had been hung upside down while the abuse took place. It should be noted that the footage was so graphic that several members of the jury sought psychological counseling in the aftermath of the trial, while prosecutors admitted to being traumatized at the trial's conclusion. They were the most devastating thing I'd ever seen, said Ruby Malinog. I cried when I was watching them. In fact, I feel like crying just now while talking about it. It was hard to believe what I was seeing and hard to believe that somebody could do those things to children. One of the top figures in the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime called the case the most horrific thing she'd ever had to deal with, with Peter's crimes being so severe that the Philippine government flirted with the idea of reintroducing the death penalty, which had previously been abolished less than 10 years prior. Northern Mindanao Chief Prosecutor Jamie Umpa was quoted as saying, if I had my choice, it would be death for Scully. I want it to happen. We have to send a strong message to others that if they come to the Philippines and torture and abuse our children in this way, they will be investigated with the full force of law and executed. At one point during the trial, Peter Scully appeared to laugh and joke with his confidants, but when he was found guilty on one count of human trafficking and five counts of violating underage girls, he failed to see the funny side. The six counts were enough to secure a life sentence, but not all Peter's crimes had been accounted for. In November of 2022, Peter received a second conviction and was sentenced to an additional 129 years in prison. 
while his more repentant accomplice, Karma Alvarez, received life with the possibility of parole. Lazo Margallo Castaña was sentenced to 126 years in prison for being an active participant in the exploitation. Two other accomplices, Alexander Lau and Maria Dorothea Chia, who were said to have played a lesser role in the exploitation ring, were sentenced to nine years apiece. Since his imprisonment, Peter has complained of the conditions in the prison he's being held at, claiming overcrowding and underfeeding has led to a rapid deterioration in his health. Jail warden Ferdinand Pontilio told the media that he wants to be pampered with luxury food and a mobile telephone so he can make international calls. He wants the same conditions as there are in Australian jails, but this is not Australia. Peter has refused to comment on the allegations, but it stands to reason that his lifelong home is severely overcrowded. The Val Prison and Penal Farm was built to house no more than 350 prisoners, but as of November 2022, it was home to almost 2,000 inmates. Yet it's difficult to feel any sympathy for a man who showed such a despicable lack of mercy or empathy for those whose lives he succeeded in destroying, all for his own perverse financial gain. But perhaps the most terrifying aspect of Peter's case is that jailing him barely made a dent in the ongoing effort to rid the world of child exploitation. There are many, many more monsters like Peter, who lurk in the darkest, most forbidden corners of the dark web, dedicated to spreading the most heinous and unforgivable filth known to man. The only silver lining of such a dark, foreboding cloud is that for every evil, dark web predator, there are a dozen equally dedicated law enforcement agents who want nothing more than to put them in handcuffs. A couple of years ago when I was in high school, I was hanging out with some of my friends and they started talking about the deep web. My friend George had been on it before and he was telling us things about it. We talked about the deep web for the whole lunch period at school and I started to get really curious about it and wanted to give it a try sometime. Later that day, when I got home from school, my curiosity got the better of me and I decided to try to access the deep web. I was texting with George and he told me the browser to get and what to do. I followed his instructions and I was able to get on. Then I looked up some deep web websites to visit. The very first one that I went to was a screen that was all black with a small icon on the upper left corner. When I clicked on it, it took me to a web page filled with images with no context. Some of the images were animals, like fish or a bear. The others were a bunch of random objects. I clicked on the fish. Then the page started loading. It took a long time to load, I would say a good 30 seconds or so. Once it was finally done loading, I saw my face on the screen. It was coming from my webcam. I quickly scrambled to find a blanket from my bed and covered the webcam with it. The screen then went black. I was relieved to see, but then some text started to appear on the screen, getting typed out. The first thing said my name, but not just my first name, it was my full name, first, middle, and last. This really freaked me out. Then, to my horror, more of my personal information started to be typed out on the screen. It said the school I attended, then my phone number, and then the state and city that I lived in. I couldn't take it anymore, and I went to close out of it. But when I tried, I couldn't. My mouse was frozen. I tried pushing Control alt delete many times, and nothing happened. I began panicking and pressing random buttons on my keyboard. I went to turn off my monitor, but nothing happened still. Then I pushed the power button on my computer and still nothing happened. Finally I went to the wall and unplugged the power source which was an extension cord plugged into the wall. 
Everything turned off at that point. I sat there in shock for several minutes before plugging my computer back in to delete the browser. Thankfully, I had been planning to get a new computer for a while and I got one shortly after. I will never forget that experience with the deep web. I used to visit the deep web all the time. I have always been into computers and my friends and I would occasionally visit the deep web out of curiosity when we were younger. One day, I was by myself in a deep web chat room. The chat rooms on the deep web always seemed to entertain me. On this day, I was mostly just watching people talk, but I occasionally would chime in. Then, one of the users in the chat mentioned me. We were having a conversation, but then it turned into a bit of an argument. The other user said something along the lines of that he was going to get me. I assumed he was joking and I responded with a wise crack. That made him angry and he said some more bad things to me. At that point I was getting kind of uncomfortable so I decided to leave and I closed out of everything and logged off. About 10 minutes later I received a text on my phone. It was from an unknown number and it said why did you leave? This was pretty creepy, but I knew that there were a lot of skilled hackers that went on the deep web, so I wasn't all that amazed. I decided to ignore the text and hope that he wouldn't contact me again. I figured it was just some guy trying to scare me, and while I have to admit I was a little bit scared, I tried not to let it eat at my brain. A couple of hours later, my phone started ringing. It was an unknown number. I picked it up and answered. There was no voice on the other end, but just breathing. I hung up on them and went back to what I was doing, but a few minutes later, I happened to glance out my front window and noticed there was a car parked in front of my house. I looked to try to see who it was, but from the angle it was parked and also it being dark outside, I couldn't see. I kept my eye on it over the next few hours. It didn't move at all. Eventually, I tried to get some sleep. I covered all the windows in my house and double checked all the locks before I went to bed. It took me a long time, but eventually I was able to fall asleep. The next day, I woke up and went to the window to check and see if the car was still there. It was finally gone and I was relieved. When I went to go on my computer, I turned it on to see that there was already several files open. They were photos. There were a few of my house and my car and then I saw one of inside my house. Then I saw the worst one of all which was a photo of me sleeping taken from inside my house. It looked like it had been taken from my bedroom doorway. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I ran around my house checking every room but nobody was in there anymore. I went to my front door and saw that it was unlocked. I have no idea how they were able to get in my house. I am a really deep sleeper and I guess that that was why they didn't wake me up. For the next few days, I was looking over my shoulder every five seconds and kept looking out the window to see if the car would return. Everything was fine until about a week later when I woke up in the middle of the night hearing a noise coming from my room. At first I thought I was just imagining things, but then I sat up just in time to see the back of a man walking past my room. This time I called the police immediately. As I did, I heard the person leaving my house. I had no interest in going after them. The police arrived about 10 minutes later and I explained the whole thing to them. I know I should have called the police after the first time, but I just felt stupid because it was my own fault for going on the deep web. The police took down the information and said they would patrol the neighborhood over the next few nights. Nothing more happened since and I won't go on the deep web anymore.
This story took place a long time ago, sometime in the mid-2000s. I was in high school at the time, and my favorite thing to do after school was play on my computer. I know, I know, I wasn't one of the big popular jocks, but I was a really shy kid, and gaming was always fun for me. I had heard about the deep web, and one day, I decided to go on it for the first time. I was pretty good with technology, so I was able to figure out how to get on pretty easily. I visited a couple of websites that were pretty normal, and the more time I spent, the more I was able to find the unusual websites. They were some of the craziest websites I had ever seen. I remember I came across a website that seemed to be filled with puzzles and codes of some sort. I looked at them for about 10 to 15 minutes, and it was pretty interesting to try to understand them. But suddenly, out of nowhere, my fax machine started printing something. When it came out, it was a paper with a large series of numbers on it. I didn't know how this was able to happen. Then, it printed another and another. I started to get creeped out, and I took all the rest of the paper out of my printer so that it would stop. My printer kept trying to print things. Then my phone started ringing. It was an old landline, of course, and we didn't have caller ID, so I answered it to see who it was. But all I heard on the other end was a series of beeps and similar noises. I hung up the phone and decided I needed to log off of the deep web. I closed out of the website and turned my computer off. I was pretty shook up from what had happened. Then the phone rang again, and I once again answered because my parents were still gone at work, and I didn't know if it would be them calling. But once again I just heard the noises that I had heard before. I hung up again. The printer was still making noises as well. I ended up unplugging the printer from the wall, and I started to ignore the phone calls that kept coming in. Finally, I decided to unplug the phone from the wall as well. My parents came home from work a little while later, so I plugged the printer and phone back in. I was really hoping that the phone calls and the faxes would not continue. Thankfully, they didn't and everything went back to normal. However, about two weeks later, I received a letter in the mail addressed to me with no return address. When I went inside and opened it up, I saw that it was a paper with more numbers of code. I got extremely freaked out, but thankfully nothing else happened, and I never got any more faxes, phone calls, or letters. I don't know who or what was behind the letter and the phone calls, but I'm hoping it was just a skilled hacker having some fun. Let me set the scene. The year is 1998, and the Euro is created. I was of the age of 14, sitting on my parents' desktop PC, using god-awful dial-up internet to research the history of William the Conqueror's harrying of the North, when my friend, who for the purposes of this story shall be called Jake, messaged me on IRC. Hey, some dude at school told me something really cool you can do on your PC. What? I asked. 1. Open up Start. 2. Go to Run. 3. Enter 2ndrely2.frt. 4. Tell me when you're done. I did what he told me. What opened up looked like some type of command prompt. It had two boxes that text should be entered into, and a regular command line. Done, I informed him. In the box write your name, and the second write a password and in the other bit write rtileoh.us. I did exactly what I was told, and a box telling me to enter a nickname popped up. I wrote Tom Elton. The window closed. A few moments later, a batch file opened that said, Welcome to the Artile, Ohio chat room. User Tom Elton has joined. I spent the next few months talking to my friends on that chat room. I had no idea who created it or hosted it. It seemed to only work in the Artile, Ohio area, meaning I could talk to anyone there in theory. 
The only people who were there was me, Jake, and a couple of other people I was friends with. Someone from the preparatory school across town, and once, somebody who claimed to work for the insurance company's tech support, who left after the only response he got was, What school you at? I don't know why we use this instead of a normal chat room. Maybe the whole secret gathering aspect of it made us more drawn to it. I don't know for sure. I woke up one fall morning and checked the chat room and found out that I had been promoted to an administrator. I had no idea who did it, but I got to brag to my friends for the next few days and change what people were typing to make them look dumb. But other than that, my powers went unused until one day I logged on to see that the anonymous messages to admins was not empty for a change. I wish I didn't check to see what was there. It was a full story from a user called 09HDI7RF, written in multiple single sentence messages. They described how they were being physically abused by their parents, how they weren't allowed to go outside the house, and how she snuck into her dad's computer and saw this chat room open, and decided to tell anybody she could. I responded with, Who is this? Also, if this was real, you would have called the cops. Later that day, the chat room stopped working. I couldn't get it to work at all. I got an error message every time I searched the command on my PC's run feature. I was royally pissed off with the fact that me and my friend's secret hidey hole was now dead. Two days later, what do I see in the news? Girl shot dead by her father after breaking out of her home through a window. The mother was in police custody, but the father was never caught. The family's PC contains documents describing kids named Jake, Tom, and others, describing what he imagined their appearance to be and what he would do to them if he ever found them, which was too horrific to describe here. That man was never caught, to my knowledge. He is still on the run today, hiding amongst everyone. I'm certain that he will never be caught.